Shema. There are times when even a biblical mitzvah of Shema, one would be exempt. Does anyone remember any of those times when one would be exempt from reciting the Shema, even though it's a biblical obligation? Yes. When, when on a day you get married. Ah, that's right. A groom, a chassan, is exempt from reciting the Shema. That's right. Thank you, Ben. A chassan is exempt from reciting the Shema on the night of his wedding. He is exempt from the night Shema. I'm going to guess, Rabbi, I'm going to guess it's when you're sitting shiva for someone after they die. So, so you're close, very close. Uh, that's another example uh, Susan is mentioning, but it's not exactly when one is sitting shiva, but it's actually before the burial. Okay, okay. Uh, that was a good, a good... Uh, a guess, it was close, a guess. Very close. A rest, a very guess. Close. <laughs> so, the, um, so, so there are a few examples of cases where one would be exempt, and that's what we're going to be learning now. Um, what are the cases of exemption and when does it apply? I should also mention that we're starting this third par parak, this third chapter of Gemara. Um, uh, for those that were not with us uh, before, uh, we, we should always remember that you cannot paskin a halacha. We don't know the final halacha uh, from these, um, you know, from what we learn here. This is, uh, this is uh, Gemara. Gemara is the uh, source of the laws, but it's not the final uh, verdict. So one would need to really uh, uh, involve themselves with the uh, laws in the Shulchan Aruch, the laws of the code of, that are written in the code of law, uh, and then the later Paiskim, the later rabbis who have applied those laws to the practical situations nowadays. So although we're going to see a lot of halachis here, it's not necessarily the final verdict. It's not, it's, it's not um, something that you can fully rely upon. And definitely don't tell someone off because you learned in the Gemara something else. It, it could be that the Gemara that we learned is not the final halacha. There might be other opinions. There might be um, um, other Gemaras that argue with it. There might be uh, Kabbalistic uh, in Yanim that are, uh, you know, uh, 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 that say a person should be, uh, should follow, uh, you know, should do something else. So therefore, it's important to... Um, realize that we cannot we cannot assume that this is the final halacha. So we're now going to begin. We're on Yud Zayin Amit Beis, the beginning of Rabbi, Isha Mesa. Rabbi, you have a question, yes. Rabbi, one more thing. I remember that if you dig a grave by yourself, you have nobody to replace you. I think you are also uh, not, uh, don't have to say the Shema at that time. Good, good, very good. It's good you mentioned right. that. There are numerous, right, there, there are uh, other cases such as um, uh, those that are involved in, 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 in the different types of situations where one is involved in the burial. Okay, so we're going to begin. Misha Maisai Mutalafanov. If a person's, um, if a person's mace, a person's uh, deceased relative is Mutalafanov, is placed before them, before him. So if a person's relative passed away, he is exempt from Shema, umin umin atfilin from tfilin, um call mitzvahs muris patira and from all the mitzvahs that are mentioned in the taira. So a person who's relative passed away and our, our Mishnah uses the term it's in, in, in the deceased is in front of him. The Gemara will discuss that. Um, does it have to be that the, the, the deceased is, is there or is it, uh, you know, uh, how else can, you know, what is, the, what is the Mishnah? Why is the Mishnah specifically emphasizing that? Well, we'll talk about that in the Gemara. But if a person's relative passed away, they are exempt from Shema. And our, our Mishnah uses the term tefillah, which is davening. The, the, on the side, there is a girsa, there's a version that takes out those words, tefillah. And then the Mishnah continues and says he's exempt from tefillin, 
and from all mitzvahs that are mentioned in the Torah. So that's like a, seems like a blanket statement. Uh, before the burial, a person is called an oinen. A person whose relative passed away is called an oinen. In fact, the, the, the Chumash talks about an oinen. In the Chumash, it mentions that an oinen, a person whose relative passed away before the burial, or the day of the burial, they are called an oinen. They are biblically um, uh, called an oinen. There's, there's rabbinic oinen and there's biblical oinen. The biblical oinen is, is when a person's relative passed away and they weren't buried yet or the, the day of the burial. And, and he did that. the law is that they are not allowed to eat miser sheni. As we say, okay. I did not eat from Meiser Shani. Meiser Shani is the second tithing person supposed to eat in Jerusalem uh, after that, when they have a field and they bring the second tithing to Jerusalem to eat and enjoy the fruits. Um, that mitzvah is not allowed to be done if a person's an Einan, because you have to be done, it has to be done with joy. And uh, if a person's an Einan, of course, Kas uh, um, uh, it wouldn't be able to be done with joy. And therefore, it's prohibited for an Einan to. Uh, eat from Meister Shani. So the word Einen is a is the word that we might we're going to be using. So it's important to uh, to remember. Einen means a person whose relative passed away. They're not sitting shiva yet. Einen is before the shiva. Okay. And the Einen is uh, bef- you know it's it's um, it, it, the idea of Einen is that the burial didn't take place yet, and they're involved with the mitzvah of burial. They're involved with the uh, it's it's a very uh, you know uh, they're in a state of, of of loss and they're involved in the mitzvah. Of, I guess it's two points. One is of course the grieving, and the second is the um, the idea of being involved with the with the actual burial. So uh, we did the first line of the Mishnah, and I should mention that there are different exemptions that we see in the Mishnah. One is the exemption of Shema. Another one is the exemption of Tefillin. And then the Mishnah says, all the mitzvahs that it says in the Torah, you're exempt from. Now, one question that I would like to ask you is, so does that mean you're allowed to go and eat at McDonald's? If a person is exempt from all the mitzvahs. No, no way. Can you go and keep no. What? You still have to keep kosher. I would say you still no. Have to keep kosher, but it says you're exempt from all the mitzvahs. What do you think, Yehuda? But uh... Yehuda, Yehuda. From from the uh, from, the positive mitzvahs. from the what? The positive mitzvahs. That's right. Yehuda said it. That's that's. Correct. Thank you, Yehuda, for clarifying. This does not mean you can go and transgress and go and uh, and rob a bank and uh, go and shoot someone. You, you know, the, you're exempt from the positive mitzvahs, but you're not exempt from any of the negative. The negative mitzvahs, you always say you have to keep all of them. And um, the the exemption here is um, is all the positive mitzvahs. We don't want you to go and involve yourself with the positive mitzvahs because you should be involved with the burial. Now, another uh, question that's asked on this Mishnah is, if you're exempt from all of the mitzvahs in the Torah, why does the Mishnah say you're exempt from Shema, you're exempt from Tefillin? According to some, the Mishnah says you're exempt from Tefillah, and then it says you're exempt from all the mitzvahs. If you're exempt from all the mitzvahs, aren't you exempt from, from Shema and Tefillin and Tefillah? Yes. Yes. Robert? Yeah, Robert. Oh, thank you, Robert. Well, I think that in some respects, there's a hierarchy of mitzvot, which the most important one is to say the Shema. And then for the man, it's to put on Tefillin. So all the others are in general categories, but they're those that are mandatory every day for some to, to perform. So, so there are certain mitzvahs that are like overriding. You might, yeah, you might think I think that. absolutely. 
you, you might think that you're not exempt from Shema, even though you're exempt from all mitzvahs. Okay. Good, well, you good shouldn't point. be. You, obviously, you shouldn't be because that, you know, and that's the more one of the most important for everybody to do um, in shacharit. So, um, well, begin with shacharit in any case. <clears throat> right. Right. Good point. Very good. Very well said. So uh, the, uh, the the point is that even if one is exempt from all mitzvahs, you might think maybe Shema is different. Shema, what is unique about the Shema mitzvah and the Tefillin mitzvah? Both of these mitzvahs involve concentration. So they, they, they really are, uh, they, they, they carry a, a different element uh, than, most, than most other mitzvahs because most other mitzvahs, it's more the action that's important. And if you don't have the right intention, in the concentration, you still did the mitzvah. You, you might not have uh, uh, done it on the highest level, but listen, you put up a mezuzah, you put up a mezuzah. You know, you, 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 uh, you, you made kiddush, you made kiddush. Did you have in mind the, you know, the full concentration that you're sanctifying the Shabbos? I don't know, but you, you said the kiddush. You know, all uh, other mitzvahs you are um, fulfilling uh, without concentration. Uh, although, of course, it's better to concentrate and, and understand the mitzvahs well, uh, but you fulfill them. Here we're dealing with mitzvahs that are uh, mainly concentration. Shema is accepting the yoke of heaven. That's the main mitzvah. If you miss it, if you don't have the acceptance of the yoke of heaven, then you really have not fulfilled the mitzvah of Shema. Uh, yes, uh, Susan. I think what it is is when someone dies, there's no way that you can with your whole heart, do certain mitzvahs, do certain, you can't perform. You won't be able to concentrate. I think that's, well, that's a, well, very well said. said. You yeah. can't. I, mean, I think that's a good point. And I should mention that, um, uh, that, that the Shema exemption is because you can't concentrate. The, 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 the exemption of other mitzvahs is actually a different reason. The exemption from other mitzvahs is not because of concentration, but it's because you should be involved in, um, in the burial. Right. Making sure that all the arrangements are made. So that could be another reason why it specifies these different exemptions, because they are different reasons for the exemption. So that's well said, Susan. Thank you. Yes, Robert. I, I guess part of it is it's a profound distraction. Yes. When, when you're in the middle of that, there's no way that you cannot take out the most significant of the life cycle is death, the finality of life. And so that takes you away from other thoughts. Right. Okay. Well said. Yes. Uh, in other words, that, that, that excludes other type of issues that are on your mind, but they're not profound, uh, right. uh, you know, anywhere near the uh, uh, profundity of death. Right. So, also, the sadness is part of that as well. You know, doing the Shema and others, a, a somewhat a celebration of thanking Hashem for allowing you to do the, perform that mitzvot. But clearly, death does not allow you. It's not a joyous, you know, occasion to say the Shema. So the joy part, I would put to the idea of Meiser Shani, of the second tithing that you need to have joy. Um, but the, the, the other idea that you mentioned is, is, uh, you know, is, is applicable to Shema, you know, which is the, 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 uh, the pain and the, 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 the magnitude of the pain that, that one, the grieving that one is going through. Yes, uh, Ruben, did you want to say something? Yes, please. I think that the idea of, of Tefillin, not putting on Tefillin, uh, fits into what you said before, because you, when you have it on, you have to be cognizant of it. Thank you. Yes. At all times. Yes. Yes. Well, well said. I, 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 I wanted to mention that and it, uh, I, I didn't. Yes, that's good. Good. You, you mentioned it. Thank you. Um, that tefillin is similar to the Shema idea of concentration. It, it needs <coughs> concentration. In fact, one of the reasons we do not wear tefillin all day is because we acknowledge that we aren't able to concentrate as much as they were in the previous generations. And therefore the rabbis establish a person shouldn't, you know, we, we don't, we wear it for the davening and that's it. And that, that's the, uh, 
you know, that it was sort of uh, ends there. Of course, if you're learning a little after davening, you still have your tefillin on, it's okay. But the general public is not, it's not meant for us to, to, um, to uh, have tefillin on all day because uh, we can't uh, concentrate like they used to. So thank you, Ruben. Yes. Okay. So Rabbi we're Smith. To... Yes. Rob, I was going to say um, the, the, the mitzvah that's in the Shema, the first mitzvah is to love Hashem. So a person can say, I can't, I can't concentrate because I'm, uh, I'm a mourner. I'm, you know, uh, my bedet is in front of me. I haven't buried him yet. But the very first mitzvah of the Ten Commandments is to believe in Hashem, which is a positive commandment. We're not exempt from that. We may not be able to think about it and feel it and concentrate it, and but we have to believe in Hashem. Ani Hashem, you know, that's the first of the Yisrael Sadibras is to believe in Hashem. So I, I, I'm surprised that they're not saying things like, "You're exempt from all time-oriented." positive commandments instead of a, just a blanket statement because there's i mean there may are there be other things besides believing in hashem that a person is is obligated to do that's a positive commandment i think can't think of one offhand but that one itself is a prime example of a positive commandment that's not time oriented and a person's not i would think a person is not exempt no matter what of believing in hashem otherwise what's the reason for observ observing the other 612 mitzvahs if you don't believe in hashem uh -huh. So uh, uh, David is asking a very uh, powerful question. He's asking, um, would this person whose relative passed away, would he be exempt from believing in Hashem? That's a positive mitzvah. And uh, would he be exempt? It sounds like a, uh, a good question. Because um, our Mishnah says, you're exempt from all positive mitzvahs. You're exempt from all positive mitzvahs. Now, uh, I'm not sure you, you mentioned that the first mitzvah is in the Shema is, the, is loving Hashem. I'm, I'm not sure if that's uh, um, if that's so because Shema Yisrael, you know, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echad is the is is sort of also the mitzvah of 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 believing in Hashem in Hashem's unity. Hashem Echad is Hashem's unity, the unity of Hashem. So there are, you know, could, could be that's not the first mitzvah. So I don't know about that. But the, uh, the, the question is a good question. Um, would a person be exempt from believing in, 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 in Hashem? Uh, uh, Robert, what do you think? Well, I don't. Well, my belief is that it, it's our belief in God is all pervasive again, is that um, that's the context by which we live and we live as Jews, that there is Hashem and that's, that's a de facto you know, truth. And so we, so we don't question that because it's there and is always there overlooking us as our responsibility and our being as a Jew. Okay, okay. <laughs> One second, I think, is that Rabbi Shlema Yosef over there in the background? Rabbi Shlema Yosef, did you want to say something? I'm in a retirement zone. So I don't Rabbi, know. Rabbi, it's me. It's not. No, I hear Rabbi Shlema Yosef. Rabbi Shlema Yosef, is that you? Oh. oh, I see what you're trying to say. Uh, and I have to come, but I only can make it for this month. Okay. All right. Yes, Ben. Ben? I ben, you, you wanted, wanted to say. To say that when you're busy, when you are busy with the person. Yeah, I'm muted? talking. Are you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Do, do you hear me, Rabbi? Yes. O okay. I, I wanted to say when you are dealing with a dead person in front of you, it doesn't mean that you don't believe in God. You're doing everything that God commanded us as far as the dead person. So you don't have to stand there and say, oh, I believe in God. I believe in God. You are believing in God when you're dealing with it. But, but the question is, are you exempt? <laughs> you're not exempt because you are dealing with mitzvahs that are connected to the, to the kvira. Uh -huh. So, so you are not, line, you're not line. saying I don't believe. Uh -huh. Bottom line is you feel you are obligated in believing in Hashem. And uh, Robert, were you saying the same thing? That what yes. the bottom line is yes. you're obligated in believing yes. in Hashem. Yes, it's there. It's always there, there for you. So, so, so the, the the fact that the mitz, the Gemara, the Mishnah says from all mitzvahs that are mentioned in the Torah, it it means almost all mitzvahs, and it would uh, besides for believing in Hashem. 
uh, I, I think that's a, a you know a, 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 an option of explaining it. I would um, I, I, my my thought is that the mitzvah of believing in Hashem is to build up belief in Hashem. That's the mitzvah. So your your belief in Hashem that's in you, that's not part of the mitzvah. So that's that's automatic. Of course you believe in Hashem, but the building up part that you were supposed to build up belief in Hashem that you're not obligated to do. You have your regular trust in Hashem, but you're not obligated maybe when a person's relative is there to be involved in building up your belief in Hashem. You have your, you know, the natural belief in Hashem that you have, you have, and the extra building up, oh, you know, oh, I'm thinking about Hashem now and how, how, how wonderful Hashem is in creating the world and giving me what, everything I need and all that, that a person would not be obligated to do. So that would be my thought. Again, it, it, I didn't no, see not, it written anywhere, but it's just a thought of it. I don't know if you're if you're satisfied with these uh, thoughts, but I, I also like what uh, Robert and Ben mentioned. And uh, if anyone else, uh, uh, what Rabbi, Rabbi, I wanted to make another <clears throat> point, uh, that I think is extremely important. That as a Jewish people, we must bury our dead within twenty four hours, uh -huh. without a doubt. That That's a, a good point, Susan. Accomplished. Thank if you. It's Thank not you. accomplished. It's almost to me. It to me. It's it's awful. It's well, well, okay. Well, well said, Susan. Has an interesting point that she's mentioning that the um, the the uh, <coughs> mitzvah. There's a mitzvah not to uh, leave a a, a, a a deceased person overnight, and um, in Eretz Yisrael, they're extra careful about that. They they. They, they will um, go to extreme measures to, to bury a person on the same day. Um, the law is that if a person is to honor them, person is allowed to be buried, pushed off, the burial is allowed to be pushed off. But I think that might be part of this idea that we don't want um, a oinen, a person whose relative passed away, we don't want them uh, to... Um, to push off the burial, this could, whatever they're involved in might end up being pushing off the burial. So it could be uh, connected to this to, to this point that where we want him to be free to be able to uh, to to to, to um, heal to heal deal with the with the obligation with the with the, with the arrangements that are necessary. Okay, let's continue in the Mishnah. <laughs> Those that are carrying the coffin, the pallbearers. And their substitutes, and in those substitutes. So there's two substitutes, um, two groups of substitutes. And uh, the law is that these people, the, the three groups of, uh, of the uh, pallbearers, the, the initial ones, the substitutes, and their substitutes. Again, noisei hamita, the ones that are carrying the coffin, bechilufeyan, and the substitutes, bechilufei chilufeyan, and the and their substitutes, es shalafnei hamita, bees shalaachar hamita. Both the the ones that are have not carried it yet because it hasn't reached them, and those that are after the coffin that they've already carried it, es shalaf. Um, <laughs> the ones that are before the coffin, they have not carried it yet. If there's a need for them, they are exempt from Shema. If they're going to need to carry it, they are exempt. And the ones that have carried it already, if there's a need in them, they are chayovin, they are obligated. And Rashi explains because they have already fulfilled their obligation by carrying it. So even if there is a need in them, they are obligated. They will be obligated to recite the Shema. So the first part of the Mishnah was talking about a relative. The second part of the Mishnah are talking about the people who are carrying the coffin. And the um, Mishnah mentioned, and, and of course there are substitutes, and the Mishnah mentions that the ones that are yet to carry it, they are exempt. 
if they're needed, if they're going to be needed. And the ones that, um, that have carried it already, even if they're going to be needed, they are obligated to say Shema. Ve'elu ve'elu paturim in but both these and those are exempt from the davening, the full davening. Again, we're, we're dividing the Shema in the davening. There's the Shema, recital of the Shema, and then there's the full davening, which generally refers to the Shemona Esrei, the Amida, the main part of davening, the, the Shemona Esrei, and um, the 18 blessings, which now is 19 blessings. So that is the, um, that is the law of these, uh, the people, the pallbearers. So the, um, the idea is that Rashi explains that the mitzvah of davening is rabbinic. And therefore, um, they are exempt. But when it comes to the Shema, it's biblical, so they are not fully exempt. Depends who. There are, there's an exception. Now, Rashi does give another e explanation, and Rashi says that there is a difference between the time frame when a person has to say Shema and when a person has to say the davening, the tefillah. For Shema, the final time for Shema is the third hour of the day. <laughs> now it must be around 10 o'clock or 10 15 in the morning in florida is approximately the time the final time to say shema but for shimona esrei but for the davening you have until the fourth hour and really if you miss that you still have until midday which is somewhere around one o'clock it's the middle of the from sunrise to sunset or from dawn to dusk and they, it comes out approximately around one o'clock nowadays here in Florida. So that would be <coughs> that would be the final time to say the Shimona Esri. So according to the second explanation of Rashi, uh, Rashi doesn't like it, but he mentions it. So therefore, I'm sharing it with you. Rashi argues with it, but he says uh, rabbis have trans have explained this explanation. But Rashi says I don't think it fits the wording. And what is this explanation that? They are obligated to say Shema because Shema time will end and it'll be too late. And the Shemona Esrei, the davening, the, the prayer, they can, uh, they can push it off because they'll be able to, to, to recite it later. And therefore, they're exempt now. They don't have to try to daven now. There's no reason for them to daven now, even if they've already carried the coffin and so on. They, they, can, um, they, can, they, they are exempt now from davening and they will daven, they will have time later to pray. But Rashi says it doesn't sound like that because it says they're exempt. If it would say they can push it off, that would that would fit. Rashi doesn't like the wording of the Mishnah it, with this explanation. He says it doesn't flow. So that's the uh, the second case of the Mishnah. Again, the first case was talking about a person's relative. He's an Oynen. He's a person whose relative had just passed away. And it talked about all, all mitzvahs. And the second case was talking about the, the uh, pallbearers and their substitutes, and that they are exempt from Shema in, um, in, in many scenarios, although some of them might be obligated in Shema if they already carry the coffin. And then we said, but tefillah, they're all exempt. We said it's rabbinic. And um, uh, the, uh, the other explanation was there's time later to recite the davening, but Rashi doesn't like that explanation. Okay, we have uh, Ben. You have a question. Rabbi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Hebrew Kaddisha, when they are coming, are they coming with a coffin and and carry the body with a coffin, or are they carrying it with a, with some kind of a bed? And uh, what would the difference be? Well, I don't know. I'm I'm just. Just asking, actually, oh. what's happening? You know, because I never uh -huh. seen it. So, uh huh. The, actually, I think what you're what you're uh, uh, what you're saying is you're correcting me. I uh, I translated uh, those that are carrying the mita as the coffin, but really, literally, mita means a bed. So uh, uh, mm -hmm. you're right. Really, in Israel, they don't necessarily 
though they don't use a coffin they use they 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 really bury like on a stretcher type of they they they, they basically carry on a, on a type of stretcher and then they um they bury without a coffin um whoa whoa but, wait a minute what do you wait, in the united wait. states rabbi what? are you saying that in Israel, you in the United States, they come in with a coffin. No, they don't do a coffin. Now, now, now again, now, now to now to answer your question, Ben, the 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 Kadisha don't they they don't uh, bring a coffin in because that's something that the funeral home makes oh, okay. money on. They okay. have to sell it and they yeah. want to sell a, an expensive one. Uh, but the um, I see, which is okay. not according to halacha, but that's what uh, you know. That's a whole business of its own. The, 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 they they come in with a stretcher basically. That's how they, yeah. Now, um, okay. uh, according Thank to law, uh, the truth is, I mean, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily, a, 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 you know, the Mishnah uses the term mita, which is, which is a bed. And, um, and the truth is that's uh, like, uh, you know, that, that, that is really what, what the, the meaning is. Um, even in America, uh, there is a, a cemetery here that just uh, opened up and they're allowing people to be buried without a coffin. Um, so it's not it's not a it's not a, a well, against the law in America either. Um, the um, the, uh, the the Mishnah uh, mentions that the the ones who carried already, even if they're going to be needed later on to carry, they are not exempt from the Shema. So. Tysus over here has a problem with that. <clears throat> I mean, if they're going to be needed to carry, why would they not be exempt? And therefore, Tysus has a different version. He said there, there were different versions, and he chose the other version because he thinks it's more exact. And that is that anyone that's needed is exempt. Anyone that's not <laughs> needed is not exempt. That's the the Taisvis on the side here, Pachi um, Garis. Rabbi, can so, I ask you a question? So the question is, what does Rashi mean? Just one second. So what does okay. Rashi mean that they are exempt uh, from uh, if they didn't carry yet, but if they carried already, they are not exempt. If, if uh, even if they're needed. So one of the commentaries explains that it means they're needed to be part of the escorting group. They're not needed to carry. So therefore, they should still say the Shema. Um, uh, carrying would be, you know, being part of the funeral that they could still say Shema. Part of, part of the carrying group <coughs> that they would not be exempt from, that the, if, they, if they were needed to carry, they would, they would be exempt. If they're not needed to carry, then they're, uh, the, the, even if they're needed for the funeral, but they're not needed to carry, therefore they are <laughs> going to be obligated to recite the Shema. That's just one of the explanations of Rashi. And uh, uh, Susan, you had a question. Yes. Uh, when you're saying that they are carrying the body on a, some type of a, not a bed, but a, like a whatever. stretcher. Is yeah. it a stretcher? <laughs> Is the body stretcher. covered? Yeah. Something? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and the body is 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 being is, is clothed. It prepared. Is the body prepared to? Yeah, be what we're prepared? talking about here is, is after all the preparations were done and they're 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 heading towards the uh, cemetery. Okay. And uh, I should I should mention also the reason why we talk about substitutes and the substitutes of substitutes is because <clears throat> you have to imagine the way things were in the olden days. In the olden days, you know, they, they, they were, it was very hard to carry. They were not carrying 20 feet. They were carrying uh, five miles, maybe. Right. And therefore, it was a huge, you know, this was a, this was a, a major endeavor. And, um, and therefore, there were substitutes and substitutes of substitutes. They had right. to travel outside of the city, wherever the cemetery was. Yes, uh, Robert. Yes. Now, obviously, this discussion creates great interest. So I want to know, where is the laws of, dealing with the death located? Is it, a, is it a section of the Shulchan Aruch or is there a separate yeah. tractate that deals with that? Because clearly it's very close to all of us. So I'd like to understand it even more fully. 
Uh, first of all, it's not, may it, may it not be close to any of us. Uh, Hashem, we should all have long lives. Hashem. <laughs> all of our relatives and friends should all have long lives and anyone, every nice. yid should have long lives and everyone. Uh, but uh, the, um, uh, there is a section of Shulchan Aruch in Yeridea that uh, deals with, uh, you know, deals with these laws. And um, there's a tractate called Tractate Smachis. And there's a tractate called Might Cotton. So there are two tractates that, uh, that uh, you know, that are involved with uh, these type of laws. Thank you. Yeah. Next piece of the Mishnah, next, uh, next part of the Mishnah. Kavru Eshames, if they already buried the deceased, the Chazru, and they returned. Rabbi, Rabbi Smith. Yes. I was just going to tell to Robert, there's uh, at least two good books in English uh, on death and mourning by Rabbi Norman Lamb from Yeshiva University. And I forget the other one, but it, there, there, there are two um, fairly common um, books on that, that distill all that stuff from Shulchan Aruch. Because like you said before, you can't uh, decide a halacha from Gemara. So this sort, of, this sort of boils it all down from Shulchan Aruch and it tells, you know, what are the halachas for this, that, that, and there's a big index. And these are paperback books that are available. Right. I'm sure you can get them on Amazon. Right. Thank you, David. I, I'm, I'm knowledgeable about uh, Lamb's book. I was not about the other, but I'll look it up. Thank you for You're welcome. allowing me to remember that. So the Mishnah continues and says, if they buried the deceased, the Chazru, and they returned. So in Yechelem Lahaschil Beligmar, if they can start the Shema and complete it, Ad Yagiu Lashura, until they reach the row, yaschilu, they should start. Say the Shema. Ve'imlav, if they're not going to be able to finish, lo yaschilu, they do not start it. They should not start it. And ha'oimdim b'shura ha'pnimiyim, ha'oimdim b'shura, those that are standing in the row, ha'pnimiyim peturim, the ones that are on the inner row, they are exempt. Ve'hachitsoinim chayoven, and the outer ones are obligated. So the final clause of the Mishnah is talking about a case, talking about the custom in those days where they would uh, have a row different than ours, different than our custom nowadays. Our custom nowadays is that after burial, we do make two rows and we have the mourners walk through the row and everyone says, uh, may Hashem console them. We, that, that's what that's the, uh, the the common custom nowadays. As long as there are at least ten men, then they make the row and uh, they walk four four amis, which is six feet away, six to eight feet away from the uh, from from a grave, uh, and they make two rows and and the 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 uh, participants make two rows and the mourners walk <laughs> through the row and everyone uh, wishes their condolences. Now uh, in the in, in in days of the Gemara. Um, they, the, 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 the people used to actually walk to the mourner and wish their condolences. So the mourner would sit down, uh, would sit down or would stand in his place or sit down and, uh, and everyone would walk by and wish their condolences. And so that's the row. They would make a row of people and uh, you would uh, wish your condolences. And, um, and so the law is that there were, Often more than one row, and therefore the um, the, uh, the only the front row would would be uh, needed to um, um, uh, you know who are visible to the, the, the you know who are close close up they would be exempt from the from the uh, shema but the outer rows they weren't close up they were obligated in reciting the shema so that's the um, the completion that completes the Mishnah, and um, we are going to begin the Gemara now. Unless anyone has questions, any questions? Okay, let's start the Gemara. Mutal, Rabbi, yes. Uh, so, is is the in the quantity in the uh, line after that in parentheses? Is that a uh, that? You, that was not discussed. Nashim, Avadim, Ketanim, etc., are patur from all of this. 
Is that something that was added after the fact or what exactly? So, so that's a uh, Mishnah later on. The question is, where should you include that clause? Should it be on this page on 17b or should it be on 20a? And um, the, uh, basically it fits to 20a. Uh, so if you look at 20a on the bottom, you'll see it starts with that clause. So if you say it here, then you skip it over there. But uh, the, the only thing is the Gemara there talks about it. So it, it fits, to, fits over there uh, a little better. Okay. So um, Thank you. in other words, the, the point is that, that um, it, it, it breaks up the Gemara in two. Otherwise, if you, if you have it here, then you don't have that Mishnah there. You just, you just have the, you have that Gemara um, you have that Gemara as part of, as an explanation on our Mishnah, and you, you sort of like separate, you sort of have, have two separate Mishnahs together. So it fits better, I think, because it's a different, it, it really touches upon a different aspect of exemption. So maybe that's why they divided it into two. Uh, in, in other words, it could have been here, and then, you know, uh, we just have a longer Gemara. But I think it, because it divides, it sort of like talks about a different aspect of the exemption therefore um it's divided in two and and um whenever you have parentheses in in a mishnah or in, in a gemara it always means you do not read it the parentheses were added to say take this out but we don't want to fully take it out we'll put the parentheses in whenever there's brackets you read them so that's just a general rule in gemara uh that in the gemaras whenever you have parentheses you skip it Whenever you have brackets, you read it. So um, the Gemara uh, starts off with a question, which I touched upon. Our Mishnah did not just say if a person's relative passed away, they are exempt. It says if a person's relative is placed before them, they're exempt. So the Gemara says, muta lafan of in, if the, if the, um, deceased is placed before him in yes he's exempt and if he's not placed before him he is not exempt let us ask a contradiction for a mini let's ask a contradiction from this is uh, in both uh, tractates that deal with uh, death it says if a person's relative who passed away is placed before him he eats in another house he's not supposed to eat in front of the deceased he eats in a bias another house which sometimes <coughs> means another room <coughs> and the the main like bias if a person doesn't have another house or another room, he should eat in his friend's house. And the reason is because it's called loyeg larosh. Loyeg larosh is a term mocking the poor. Loyeg larosh means mocking the poor. And we generally use that term for someone who passed away. Someone who passed away is considered poor. They can't do mitzvahs anymore. And uh, they're, they're not capable of doing anything physical. And so if a person um, um, would eat in front of them, it would be mocking them because um, it shows that a person is dealing with their, uh, themselves and not caring about the deceased. And therefore, it would not be right to eat in front of them. And according to uh, this brisa, it, 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 it is a obligation for a person to uh, either eat in a, another house or in his friend's house. And then the, the, it continues and it says, mm-hmm. if he doesn't have um, a house of his friend nearby, he makes a mechita, a separation, and he eats. He makes some type of a 
um, partition, and he eats there as long as he's not in front of the deceased. What happens if he doesn't have anything to make a partition? He turns his face away and he eats. So he doesn't eat in front of the deceased. He turns the other direction and eats. He does not eat meat and he does not drink wine. Rabbi, Rabbi, you skipped a couple of words. I did? Yeah. Thank you. Mesiv is like what we say in uh, the Manashtana. Kulanu Mesubin. It, uh, Rabbi, I need it's to ask fine. you. This is you're talking yeah. about this before the burial that you don't eat in front of the person the who is in mourning. Correct. No, the person not, not the person in front of them. No, no, not the correct. dead. Not the person not who's in mourning. The, the dead. dead. Not the deceased. You don't eat in front of the deceased. That they didn't pick up the body yet. Uh, okay. You know, the chevra kadisha did not come to pick up the to to, to pick up the okay. body, and therefore. Um, a person would not be allowed to eat in front of. Also, the let me ask: You don't leave the body by itself, do you? Never. That's also true. It's called a shimer. That's correct. You're supposed to have a shimer, which we'll soon see about that. Okay. Sorry. Good sorry point. Now, uh, so the person is not supposed to recline. The ena mesa a person doesn't recline and eat. Um, they reclining is a way of eating in a very chashuv. It's a it's a honorable, a a, a dignified, a very um, um, it's a hidur, isn't uh, it? Chashivos. It's a way of uh, eating in luxury. It's a luxurious way of eating when you're reclining, and that's why we recline on Pesach when we drink the wine and eat the matzah. We recline as a way of showing freedom and being uh, 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 luxurious. And, um, and so uh, in, in such a situation, a person doesn't do that, doesn't recline. Veino <laughs> basar is not allowed to eat meat. Veino is not allowed to drink wine. Now, these laws apply to a oinen. They don't necessarily apply to shiva. During shiva, a person is allowed to eat meat and drink wine. Obviously, a person's not supposed to get drunk, but they are allowed to eat meat and drink wine. But during the Oynen, the time of Oynen, which is before the burial and um, um, the day of the burial, they are not allowed to eat meat or drink wine. And Ve'ina Mavarech, Ve'ina Mazamin, they don't even say a bracha. And Rashi translates this to be, they don't say the, the bracha on Hamaitzi. They don't make the bracha Hamaitzi. Ve'ina Mazamin, Rashi translates as they don't need to recite a birchas hamaza in the grace after meals. So they don't make the first bracha, they don't make the final bracha. And, uh, and Rabbi, wouldn't Be'en Mezamen mean that, that they can't get together with three people to make a, 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 a zimun? So it, it, that would seem to be the, the correct <laughs> translation, but Rashi says they don't need to recite the birchas hamaza. So what so what is ve'eno mevarech mean? Ve'eno mevarech means they don't recite the initial bracha hamaitzi. Ah. So they don't say the bracha hamaitzi, which is the, the blessing on bread, and they don't recite the berchas uh, hamas in the grace after meals. Ve'en mevarech and alav, uh, and others don't need to recite the bracha for them um, in the, the blessing of uh, hamaitzi. Ve'en mezamn and alav, and here Rashi says we they don't do a zimun; they're not part of a zimun. So it basically covers all all cases um, that there is no uh, there's no there's no zimun, there's no after bracha, there's no initial bracha, there's no being mitzi, and. Um, So, and, so, Rabbi, is it meaning to say that you shouldn't eat bread or you should eat bread without a bracha? Eat bread without a bracha. And it doesn't only apply to bread. 
This would apply to, to, to any food. Any <clears throat> now, upater mi kriyashma, and he is exempt from shema, umenatfilo umenatfilin, from prayer and from tefillin, he's exempt from all of these. We call mitzvahs amuras b'tayra from all mitzvahs that it says in the Torah. Uva Shabbos, but if it's Shabbos, different laws. On Shabbos, mesa v'yoichel basar, he can recline and he eats meat. V'shayseyayin and he drinks mm. wine. Umavarech and he says brachas. He and. Umavarich, umazamein, and he, he says the bracha before, he says the bracha after, umavarich and alav, they can, they, they can make the bracha for him, umazamein and alav, they can include him in the zimun, v'chayev v'chol ha-mitzvahs ha-amuray spatayra, he is obligated in all the mitzvahs that it mentions in the Torah. So on Shabbos, whole different uh, um, uh, set of rules, and the reason is, of course, because on Shabbos, he can't be involved in the burial, so he is he he is allowed to uh, he would be allowed to um, uh, so, he, he would recite brachas. So this is for the onen. For the onen, we're talking about the person who's 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 deceased is still not buried, and yet he he will be reciting brachas. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel Oimer. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says, "Mitoich sheneschayev ba'elu neschayev bekula." Because he is obligated in need, he is obligated in all the mitzvahs. V'amar Rabbi Yechanan, and Rabbi Yechanan asks, My benayhu. How does this Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel differ from the first opinion? We've got a first opinion that says he's obligated in all the mitzvahs that are said in the Torah. And Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says that he is, because he's obligated in these, he's obligated in all the mitzvahs that it says in the Torah. That includes the negative commandments. Well, we never exempted anyone from the negative commandments. Uh, everyone is always obligated in the negative. Here we're, we're, we're talking about the positive. So it, it seems surprising that Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel would argue on the uh, initial uh, opinion, the, the Tanakama, the first view, because the first view also said he's obligated to all the mitzvahs, and Rav Shemim Gamliel says basically the same thing. It says since he's obligated in this, he's obligated in all the mitzvahs. So, V'am Rav Yechanan might be nice. Rav Yechanan asks, what's the difference between these two opinions? So the Gemara answers, Tashmish Hamito Iko Beinaihu, the difference is having relations with one's wife, that according to Rav Shimon, he is <laughs> obligated in uh, the mitzvah of being with his wife on Shabbos, and according to the other opinion, he would not be uh, uh, an, it would not be a considered a mitzvah for him to have relations with his wife when uh, they're in the state of Oinen, but it's Shabbos. So again, during, of course, if it wasn't Shabbos, they would not be allowed, but because it's Shabbos and they're not able to uh, involve themselves with the um, <coughs> with the burial, uh, so therefore, the question is, would they be obligated to, to uh, have, you know, to fulfill, let's say their wife is um, um, feeling the need uh, and uh, the husband, would he be obligated to fulfill his obligation of, uh, of having relations? So uh, the, according to Rav Shimon, he is obligated. According to the first opinion, he is not obligated. Um, and uh, that is the two opinions. Now, we still didn't get to the question. Again, we started off our, uh, our Gemara asking about the fact that our Mishnah said that there is a deceased in front of him. And there, the Mishnah said that he is exempt from many different things. All the mitzvahs, all the positive mitzvahs. And the Gemara asks, is it only when the deceased is in front of him and the Gemara is going to try to prove from here that the deceased does not need to be in front of him. Uh, 
And so the Mishnah, so the, 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 uh, the, 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 our Mishnah mentioned only if it's in front of him. And here, the, 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 the Raisa continues, Katani Mias, it comes in and develops its, its, its question now. Katani Mias, however, we learned right over here, Pater he is exempt from Shema, prayer, Tefillin, whom we call mitzvahs, Amor, Spatera, from all mitzvahs that it says in the Torah. And the way we are understanding this is, let's look at this brisa that we brought. This brisa, again, brisa is a statement that is uh, brought in a, um, it's, it's, it's not, doesn't have the editing that Mishnah had, but it has a, a um, uh, it's considered a authoritative um, um, a source. And we try to find uh, everything, we, we try to have everything fit together. If not, then we, we figure out that it must be different opinions. But generally, um, you know, the Gemara will ask a contradiction from a Mishnah to a Brisa. A Mishnah is the edited version of all the teachings. And the Brisa are some of the uh, unedited um, teachings that were also recited by the same sources, by the same rabbis. They just weren't edited into the, into the, um, the pure Mishnah format. So this source, what does it say? Let's look, let's look at this again. It said, if a person's relative has passed away and they're, they're, they're placed before them, then they can't eat in that, in that room or in that house. And, um, and then it said that a person's not allowed to eat meat, drink wine, or make brachas. And um, they don't have to make brachas and, and so on. Now, how do you read that? So the way our, our Gemara is seeing this as a contradiction, it's reading it as if it's two separate points. The brisa is divided in two. First of all, we talked about if the, if the deceased is in front of him, that has laws about eating. You're not allowed to eat there. But anyone who has a relative who passed away, even if they're not in front of him, the law is you're not allowed to, uh, you, you, don't, you, you don't eat meat, you don't drink wine, you don't say brachas, uh, you don't uh, say Shema, you're exempt from this, you're exempt, <coughs> exempt from all the mitzvahs. So that's the way our Gemara's understanding is. It seems it doesn't fit with the Mishnah because our Mishnah said that only if the deceased is in front of them, they're exempt from the mitzvahs in the Torah. And here the Brisa uh, says that you're exempt in all scenarios, even if the deceased is not in front of him. The, 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 the case that the, the deceased in front of him needs to be in front of him is regarding eating. But regarding all mitzvahs, that doesn't, doesn't apply. So that's the Gemara's question. And what the Gemara answers, the first answer of the Gemara is don't divide the Brisa in two. It's really one point. Even the Brisa, Amar Rav Papa, Rav Papa says, Tir We're talking about a case where it says that Machzir Panov, this that we said he's exempt, is when a person doesn't have another house to eat at and he's turning his face and eating, that person, he also has all these laws that he's exempt from the Shema and the other the prayers and, the, the, and all mitzvahs in the Torah is because he has no other place to go. But if he went to another place, then he would be obligated in all the mitzvahs. So that's the first answer of the Gemara, that, it, it, that, that, that our Mishnah is exact. The Mishnah says only when the deceased is in front of him. The Bryce also says only when the deceased is in front of him is he exempt from all the mitzvahs, and the, 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 he's not only he's not allowed to eat in front of the deceased, but he's also exempt from all of the mitzvahs. If he does go to another house, he would be obligated. That's the first answer of our Gemara. The next answer of our Gemara is going to, is going to uh, um, follow the original logic that there must, it must not matter if, there, if the, the deceased is in front of him or not, and we'll do that metashem tomorrow. Thank you, okay, everybody. are there any questions?